And the winner is Robin Cost Lewis. <laughs> no way. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the longest epic in the world called the Mahabharata. There is a minor character I love very much. His name is Akalavya, and he is the son of the king of outcasts, which means he is the prince of outcasts, as it were. And he aspired to be a great archer, but and there's always a but, right? So his but was that in order to achieve his goal, he wanted to study at court with the drone of the master archer. But Ekalavia was from the woods, he was low born, and Drona was the archer of the court, and so of course Drona had to reject him. But Ekalavia was determined, and so he instead went back into the woods and built a mud statue of Drona and practiced before it every day for many, many, many years. And then one day all the princes from the court found a deer in which there was a constellation, sorry, a constellation of arrows in his mouth. He had been killed. And they could not imagine what magic had taken place to kill this deer because no one, only a god, could perform that kind of archery. Indeed, it turned out to be Ekalavia. And when they confronted Ekalavia, they were like, how did you learn to be a master? Of archery, he said, well, I built a statue of the court archer Drona, and I performed before him for years and years and years, and it was because of his devotion that the gods, because of Ekalavia's devotion to his teacher, to Drona, that the gods granted him sublime vision and incredible skill. I begin with this story not be only because I love epic and not only because I love the Mahabharata, but because I've had the profound honor of studying with some of the greatest poets of our time. In my own mind, I have fashioned countless statues of writers who have honored me with their attention and time. If there is indeed anything worthy of praise or attention in my book, it is because I have copied and stolen from these illustrious writers every gorgeous and strong and sharp gesture and evil trick that I could mine. Their exquisite generosity is one of the primary reasons I am standing here tonight. To this end, please allow me to thank my teachers first. Mary McHenry, Nina Payne, the great Caribbean poet Andrew Salkey, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Marilyn Nelson, Kate Flint, Percival Everett, Deborah Landau, Yusef Kumanyaka, Toy Derricotte, Cornelius Eady, and most especially the person I call the Sharon Code, because she's so magical, Sharon Olds, who sat with me through the writing of the long title poem of my book, Voyage of the Sable Genius. Thank you deeply. Thank you as well to the institutions who supported my work, NYU, USC, and Hampshire College. Um, I'm going to skip. But over the past year, I've begun to learn about the differences between a manuscript and a book. This is my first book, which is why I'm blown away. I don't know what I'm doing standing here right now. But um, I could never imagine that a manuscript could be handled so tenderly or with such profound respect as mine has been by Alfred A. Knopf. Um, a little known story about Knopf, it's weird. When I was a little girl, I used to start drawing Borzois obsessively when I was about seven. Okay, go figure. And, and then later, 
But still, long before I became a writer, I got very interested in censorship. And so Alfred A. Knopf, the historical person, came into my field because I was doing research on censorship in the New York Society for the Suppression of Lies. What is not known about Alfred Knopf generally is that this man put aside tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, to prepare for litigation. He was so devoted to his authors that no matter what, he, he protected them. He, you can publish whatever you want, and I will litigate to protect you. So um, he went on to practice his literary activism in terms of African-American literature. He was the first person to publish Langston Hughes, Nella Larson, he went on to publish Zora Neale Hurston, and of course, my national treasures, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, Tracy K. Smith, Kevin A. Young. So it's a profound honor for me that my maiden launch is with this house for a long historical arch. I just want to thank the people who worked on my book, Sonny Mehta, you, Sonny Mehta, that guy. Annie Eggers, Josephine Cowles, Stephanie Ross, Sung Yun Kwan, Andrew Craven, Paul Bugards, Brittany Marangiello, Ellen Feldman, Susan Brown, Judy Kiviat, Edith Balthazar, Kathy Horingian, Nicholas Latimer, and most especially to my editor, the sublime Debbie Garrison. Thank you for approaching my work and me, Deb, with such meticulous and tender and profound respect. As Izzy, as E. Cummings once wrote, nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. Thank you. I'm going to take just a little bit more of your time, I'm sorry. Family comes in many guises. I found an almost mythical second home in the Kevin Cannon Foundation. Thank you for your contribution, Kevin Cannon, and for allowing me to take part in what is surely one of the richest moments in American poetry. I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, and hence I remember that terrific line, I don't remember what movie, where Billy Dee Williams says, and it's like blue fur, whatever. To Diana Ross, he says, she is a friend of my mind. And so I finally would like to thank my family and friends who have been the best friends my mind could ever have hoped for. Thank you, Sheila Coleman in Cambridge, Adrian Perry, Alice Flaherty, Claudia Rankin, Elizabeth Alexander, and most especially my deliriously good and perfect sister, Candy Lewis Watkins. I need to imagine also that my father and aunts and grandparents and cousins are all sitting on a star right now watching all of us while they're playing Big Whist and laughing. Daddy, this is your night. Maman, this is your day. And to my exquisite son, Henri, this award is completely for you. Thank you for your profound patience and love. I want to end with a poem because it's appropriate by Pablo Neruda, um, in light of what is happening in quiet. Now we will count to 12, and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much.